When you hear what I've got to say I'm sure you won't be able to turn your head away episode of the concrete man appreciate y'all for tuning in subscribing liking commenting like we got another great another great guest again we're gonna chop it up and talk about some great things uh my special guest man he's a, a art guy he's a creator he's a jack of all trades a great a great uh i guess energy always come with great energy and always got something planned and always have a bigger picture of things so I wanted to introduce y'all to my guy, Keith Oral. Appreciate you coming on, bro. Let's go with your big dog. Set up good too, I ain't gonna lie. Man. Appreciate it, appreciate it, man. I, I try, I try. Back, I try. So I always like to start the concrete off with a like an icebreaker. So it, I know you a person like you you got a great imagination and you a part like you like superheroes, stuff like that. You like stuff like that. So if you could have a superpower, what would it be and why? Yo, I thought about this for many moments. That's why I asked you. <laughs> I think it's a weird superpower, but I think the power to refurbish things, you know what I mean? Like, I think that'll play a big role in like conquering some like world hunger, you know? Okay, so but basically like having something that's used and just bringing it back to life. Just bringing it back to life. I mean, so many different, you know, buildings in regards to architect that broke down or that, you know, was demolished. You know, just looking at it, snapping a finger and having it built back up. I think that's that would be great. Right, right. So, as far as your upbringing, man, where you from? Let us know about <laughs> yourself, man. Like, where you from, man? It's about to be a, a gem drop. Uh, <laughs> so I was born in a Bennett, uh, mm -hmm. born and raised 15 years of my life. Where the Bennett at, though? You gotta let the people know where you're at, man. <laughs> right <laughs> off a of knife, like in the middle of the city. In Chester, you know, man. Chester, four miles. You know, we, what, like two miles in? Mm -hmm. um, and even with uh, saying that, it's a little bit of alienation that come with that. Right, right, right. And we, we gonna get we gonna get into that later on in the interview. That, that you know what I mean? Because it's just crazy. Right, right. Uh, but yeah, Chester, so yeah. so in the Bennett, man, like who, as far as your family, who inspired you growing up, man? Because <laughs> to have the imagination you had and have the the like the like the the will to want to refurbish things and bring stuff back to life, where did that come from? It had to come from somewhere. Uh, growing up, my pops, you know, he was really into games, really into sci-fi. I kind of took after that. Uh, my biggest inspiration, even with being an artist, stems from me studying my big cousin Fuj. Okay. Uh, just seeing him, you know, time and time again, showcase his talent and his artistry in different ways. And, you know, in a sense, he was different. Right. Uh, Shout out to Fuj, too. Chester Legend, man. Real not right. a lot of people can, you know, be, exist with that lifestyle and exist out of that lifestyle. So saying right. that, I'm like, all right, it's room for me to grow here. Definitely, definitely, definitely. So, who inspired you outside of your family? Like, who was that person you like, all right, if I can at least get close to him? Outside of, let's go local, city. Okay. City is probably one of my biggest inspirations when it comes to, you know, rapping. You know, a lot of people don't even know I like, you exactly. know, I, I rap a little bit, but <laughs> like even seeing him walk, it was a it was a time where it was real hard for me to, to I had like Fogo, what it's called, they call it Fogo, mm -hmm. fear of going out. Mm -hmm. and it was real hard for me to like embrace the city with all that was going on. Every single night you hearing gunshots and, you know, seeing city walk through the city, literally confident, broad shoulders, like, you know, this ain't nothing. I'm like, yo, bro, like I aspire to be like you. Yeah, it's possible. You know, and outside of him, Andre 3000, Kanye West, you know, the boots. Okay, okay, okay. Where okay. Joe Blum? Okay. All right, so, like, growing up, what school did you attend? Like, 
man, from here, like, schools is everything growing up in Chester. Facts. Like, you, like you going, that's where you're going to become you, I want to feel like, or you're going to become known some way. So, where school did you go to growing up in Chester? Chester Community Charter School. Uh, man, when they used to bang on the table and, like, make beats, we even had a, I'm not even going to talk about that, because that's going to resurface one day, our rap scene. Um... Other than that, Science and Discovery, where I met basically my core friend group now. Right. Then I transferred. I went to New Beginnings for like a couple months. That's where me and Zane, we linked up. Zane, cool as hell, man. He got down to earth. I guess James Kirk, he what, Marquise. Yeah. You know, the people like the people that was really like underground, nice ass ball players at that school. I right, made some right. good connections. Right. I think I graduated from a place called Concord Christian in Wilmington, Delaware. Right, because right. my mom was like, yo, the city getting too crazy. Can't really go to Chester High. I'm like, bro, I would have, you know, I would have made something out of it, but I could see. You could see which, why her understanding and her vision. I yeah. Definitely feel that. I definitely feel that. So, uh, I know you you spoke on it. Like, you ball a little bit. You are you actually are a little bit, man. You don't want to talk about that. You <laughs> talked about everybody else, but you was you actually are. You ain't, you feel me? You got to give yourself some flowers a little bit. I'm okay, but when we was <laughs> over at that Boys and Girls <laughs> Club, we was with some heavy hitters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely some pros in there. <laughs> some pros. Hey, man, it was people over there, you know, you ain't, once you lost, you wasn't bound to get another run. I mean, right. unless it wasn't, it, it was, uh, what, like five people there, then you could, you know, yeah, come you know, on, you know, but right. other than that, bro, Mike, Fat, Tam, yeah. uh, Ab, yeah. you, uh, who else? Rich. Anthony, Rich, <laughs> bro, it there. was some crazy shit. We didn't have to, uh, Tamir pull up at certain uh, points, mm. but it's crazy. Yeah, definitely a lot of time. good runs, good runs in there. So, as far as sneakers, man, I always loved sneaks. I've always been a sneakerhead. But you, like, I don't remember you being a sneakerhead until this. Like, until you said you going to go about <laughs> it a different type way. So, I, you got to give me, like, when did you love for sneakers and stuff like that coming? Uh, when I couldn't afford Jordans. And okay. I, I feel like, yo, bro, this, this story is told so many different times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but when you really live that and you really come from a place where you really can't get a pair of Jordans. Yeah, it means a lot. Man, when you get that first pair of Jordans, you're like, yeah. So uh, my first pair of Jordans was like the high OG ones. Uh, the Was it the Royals? I think it was the Royals. Okay. And I paid about, I saved up, I paid about, I think, 600 for them. I think I got I don't know where I got them just from. I think it was off like Facebook Marketplace or some shit. But I had to legit uh, check them. I went to my guy on South Street and I got it uh, legit check. Mm -hmm. And from there, every I had like 15 pairs of Jordans in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and knowing me, I gave them all away to my little cousins. Shout yeah. out to my little cousins. But right as you should. Fair um, so now, man, my sneaker collection is only ores, man. I ain't gonna lie to you, okay. bro. Everything okay. that I create, I rock. Okay. Okay. So that leads me into my next question, man. Who is Keith Orr? Like, if somebody walked up, yo, who's Keith Orr? And you ain't, you ain't even know it was you. What would you tell them, Keith Orr? Who was Keith Orr? Creative. Uh, somebody who amplifies a simple idea. Mm -hmm. Somebody who bridged the gap between like social norms and social constructs that have been put against them, and like made something out of it. I feel like. Uh, my slogan is every blemish has an aura. Imperfections breed perfection. And from nothing, we made something. We're right. That's, I feel like that's anybody from Chester. Like, ain't, like, it's really, you gotta really build something from nothing. Concrete. I'll be Definitely. concrete. Yeah, I'll, I'll be concrete. concrete. That's okay. basically what I came with. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We're right. So you understand, man. Mm -hmm. So, like, when did you take customizing sneakers seriously because like customizing sneakers is a big thing but i feel like <clears throat> excuse me i feel like you might have gained a lot of success very quickly in the customized game why do you think that and why I, I, my first question how like when did you start customizing sneakers Probably back in like 2014 okay. when I saw somebody online. And this was when Instagram was trash. Like, I ain't gonna lie. Like, it was fun at the time because everybody was posting mm -hmm. just good content, pictures of the sun, pictures of their food, mm -hmm. just cool content. Mm -hmm. And now everything algorithm based, that's another story. But I saw somebody post Angeles. Oh, I'm doing a pair of sneaks. 
first pair of sneaks I put on, I put Angelus paint on Vans, called them the Flintstones. They, they was cool, you know, then I just branched off from there. And then later on in my years, I had a love for Air Force Ones, mm -hmm. you know, the silhouette, the way how the, you know, the Nike check caress the, the, the base. When you start to understand the architect of the sneaker and Nike um, traditionally, in the traditional sense, then you'll understand the genius that an Air Force One is and why it's the top seller. Right. Um, but just the Air Force One, man, then I put that Angelus on there and I fell in love. And so Ron Day was like, yo, I need a pair of sneaks back in the day. It was like my first time really realizing, like, I got some potential. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Some Kanye West inspired sneaks. You know, I even came over to Kenny's shop and got like this box. It was like a mirror box. Uh, that I customized and now he had like this Galileo uh, Baroque art sculpture piece and I put that in the back and I'm like yo this shit hot like I ain't gonna lie like this is fire so basically like it just came from inspiration of others and then you just put your own your own little finesse on it your own sauce on it yeah the, the reason why I got some skin in the game is because of the people that I'm, I'm surrounded by mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not anybody without the people that I surround myself with. Me neither. That's why I started this. Like that's a part of that's using your, using your your connections and stuff to grow. That's all that's all it's about. That's facts. And it's just great minded people that understand where we come from and that made something out of nothing. Right, right. Rose that grew out the concrete. Right, right, right. Alright, so we talked about the art and everything and their uh what goes on, but like we talked about we from Chester, man. Like mm -hmm. talk about how you even like filtered out all the nonsense and BS that we got to wake up and go through every day. Just being from Chester, being a black man from Chester, how did you figure it out? And like, what do you think can change for the next generation or how can we help the next generation? Man, it's little that we can do, but it's a lot that we can do. And I know that sounds like a little oxymoron, but mm -hmm. I mean, like you said, even today, like, Growing, I still haven't filtered it out or am trying to filter it out. Mm -hmm. Growing up where I grew up, where a lot of people grew up, you know these people that you grow up with and then when you reach a certain stage in life, these people have connected with other people and now it's, it's a coup de tat. It's like people that's farming against you or even the crab in a barrel mentality. When crab's not supposed to be in a barrel. Mm -hmm. at all. And it's, it's a, you come to a point where you just got to, Fuck with who you fuck with and hopefully the other or the opposition, so to say, can understand that. I always look at op as not an opposition, but an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people want to hear op and think opposition. Right. Easily. Easily. Because they've never been in a situation to know that, like, even having a conversation with a person is an opportunity. You never know what a person going to give you. You never know what type of energy they want to steal in. That's facts. A lot, bro, even with family. So, it's all about just this ego and pride. I'm reading a book by Ryan Holiday called um, Ego is the Enemy. Uh, and in there, he states, you want to reach a point in your life where you've reached a certain level of success, but the hatred that comes with that success is overwhelming. Right, right. You got to pivot your mind to think that this hatred is good. Mm -hmm. It means that I'm doing something right. Right. But they going to see when I reach that point that my success is a broad thing and not just individualized to me. Right. It's everybody succeeding. When I succeed, everybody succeeds. Exactly. I'm creating opportunities. Right, right. And I feel like when you're doing something good, the hate, it's, the hate is going, you got to know the good going to come with the hate. That's facts. And if you're not doing something good and you're not good at it, ain't nobody going to be hating on you. <laughs> That's just what it is. Like, That's you gotta facts. Figure it out. Like, you want people to be hating on you, even though, like, you just got to use it to feed off of. <laughs> nah, that's facts. That's just, a gym. Yeah, and just, like, you feel me? That bad energy, just bounce it back with the good energy. Like, because eventually, this person, like, one thing about us being prepared, I feel like everybody get their flowers when yeah. the outside give the person their flowers. That's a big thing. Um, that's that's big. Yeah. That, that's big. <laughs> that's so big because you hit it on the nose, man. We gonna we we know exactly a couple of situations where everybody outside gave somebody flowers, and now it's like, all right, let's let's give him his flowers. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So another thing I wanted to ask you, like your process, like you might not know this, 
your brother Jules might know. <laughs> But I actually used to be in art too. Like I'm, yeah. I just used to be a beast with drawing. Yeah. A lot of my friends, like if you know me for a long time and went to school with me, you know. Like I really used to be drawing stuff for people. They asking me, yo, do you do my art project? Oh wow. But I don't do it no more. I fell off. It's, it's done now. So I know I used to have a process with me. Like um, that's what used to be my process. Like I like what I, what motivated me is people being surprised oh you can draw oh <laughs> yeah like because i play sports you feel me i'm yeah. known my friends but it's like oh you can you smart but you can draw too like <laughs> yeah. you don't like you, you got your degree people, though right yeah i got my degree yeah, yeah, that's, no, that's cool you gotta but, be smart to have your degree nah 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 they give them away too uh, <laughs> the, the bag right you can get one Facts. yeah the bag right you can get one they were damn kind it's all <laughs> but it's all about what you do when you there trying to get your degree you gotta make, make the, yeah make the best out of it so like what's your process when you create an art um just studying i mean i, I study great artists uh such as like andy warhol or keith herring or basquiat mm -hmm. you know like a lot of people don't notice like i really do study art right like i study art history i have a, a i have a lot of knowledge when it comes to art history so understanding and studying and having that knowledge to branch off that's that's key mm -hmm. somebody might i know you've seen splatter paint right. a lot of people do it mm -hmm. do they know where it originates from yeah, exactly exactly but it's crazy you jackson have to, pollock by the way. yeah yeah it's crazy you have to be in that real realm of artists to really like anything like a basketball player like how do you become you got to study the greeks regardless if, I, yeah. if, if that was my problem I used to have a class like that, like, uh, I had an art teacher, mm -hmm. she used to tell me, you gotta study these people to be great, but I'm like, I'm nice, everybody tell me you're nice, what you talking about? But I, I understand that, because it comes from somewhere, you yeah. gotta know what you're using, how you're doing it, what it's yeah. called, the terminologies, like, it, it means a lot. And a lot of people don't want to study because of um, a song called Maslow's Hierarchy, it's mm -hmm. like, you have to, right. you have to reach that certain level um, of survival in order to even give a fuck to study. Right, exactly. But when you in a struggle and you got you things conspiring yeah. against you, you don't give a fuck. Right, I right. don't give a fuck if I gotta wake up and I gotta make ends meet. Right. What you what you talking about, that shit don't mean nothing to me. Exactly. And that's where you gotta realize that the shit does mean something to you or it should because it could pivot your circumstances. Right, right. So, so as far as, uh, what I want to say, like, I know with this thing, it comes with a lot of ups and downs, like artwork, like, sometimes you might not sell something, sometimes you might do, mm -hmm. uh, but, like, when do you think was your, mo your, one of your moments where you just wanted to give it up, like, you thought about it, like, it might, this might not be for me. Damn, that's a hard one, uh, there was a lot of instances like that, uh, is where you reach that dip and it just, you know, these external factors start to play a big role in the way how you think, feel, you wake up with less energy, even people going to work every day, you have no time to create um, or think about anything else. Uh, I think the biggest uh, downward spiral was when either uh, I had surgery for my hydrocephalus, which is a chronic brain condition. Okay. Um, and I just went through this real tough period where I couldn't even accept looking at myself. Like, I didn't post myself on an Instagram story in my face for like two to three years. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like it was a lost identity. So how did you find out that you had it? Like, how did you find out? Because I know once you found out you had it, you're a person that's gonna do their, their research, but how did you find <laughs> out? Like, cause you know, with us black men and health yeah. and all that stuff, like we're not on top of our stuff. But for you to be young at that age and our, cause if you'd have waited, it could have went, like you feel me, we could have went bad. So like, how yeah. did you find out? Um, so it was two instances where I could have um, checked wow. legitimately. Mm -hmm. uh, like they told me straight up. And uh, a guy, you know, my neurologist or neuroscientist, whatever. Uh, <laughs> I think that's, not, that's not your cup of tea. Yeah, that's not my cup of tea. <laughs> you know, I, I get still get confused. Maybe it's hide yourself as fuck it. Um, <laughs> Yo, I went over there, I went to Taylor Hospital, man. I, I had a headache for like a week straight. And I'm like, yo, like, let me go over here. He's like, yo, uh, all right, let's do some x-rays. Sitting in a room, you're like, we see something on the scan. 
we just want to make sure it's cool. Mm-hmm. They always say that. I'm young. Mm-hmm. I'm like, man, I'm good. I'm healthy. You know, these headaches going to go by. Maybe it's on them eating. I'm right. real active. Right. Be like, yo, like, we found this. Like, you, you have hydrocephalus. And, you know, it's things that we could do right now to help it. But it's a chronic thing. They gave me pills. So I'm like, they like, you want to have to take these every day of life again. Like, what the fuck? Nah, I'm not taking those. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Especially I, being where we from and that's against with your morals. Like, you already seen enough of the drug use and you know how that can go. Man, two years later, three years later, built up to a point where I had something called vertigo. And the minute that I moved my head or shifted, um, just a little brief, John. So hydrocephalus is cerebral, uh, excess amount of cerebral spine fluids in a brain cavity. Everybody has cerebral uh, sp- uh, fluids in their head. Some people have more than enough to that can be drained. Mm-hmm. I have a blockage, so it builds up. Um, one day, bro, I'm balling. I fall over in LA Fitness. Bull's like, yo, you all right? I'm like, hold on, bro. Like, I got to go to the hospital. Go to the hospital. I get what is called a spine puncture, a lumbar puncture. That's where they put a needle in your back and they drain it. All right, cool. Right? A couple months later, same thing happened. Got another one. I'm like, cool. The third time, they like, yo, you can't do it anymore. Um, in fact, if you would have came in here a week later, you would have died. So I had to get a shunt. I have a mechanism in my head that, you know, for the rest of my life, it drains the cerebral spine fluids. But hey, fuck it. That's, that's, <laughs> like, story. that's, that's what makes the story even greater, man. Like, so, like, after going through all that, man, you ain't give up. You ain't say it's over. You ain't say, like, you kept doing your thing. Like, and being from Chester, like, you a gym, man. You from Chester, you're a black man. You grew up in the hood. Facts. You went to college and graduated, man. Like, you a gym out here. Like, we gyms out here for real. Yeah, but you feel me? Even though we know, like, getting there, anybody can get there. But the finish is different. So how how does that feel knowing that you, like, got through all the pitfalls of Chester, all the stuff that wanted to bring you down, even your health tried to bring you down, and you still accomplished your goal? Um... So, I graduated from Temple in May, mm-hmm. but you might as well say I graduated, bro. Yeah. I graduated from uh, Delaware County with my Associates of Science, mm-hmm. uh, my, uh, yeah. But Temple, I graduated in May, and I, all the classes is leading up to what I'm going to be doing. It's like spring spring. You might as well say I graduated, that stuff. Okay. The journey is uh, more real than the actual resolution, or not resolution, like the ending. Like, when you on your journey, you start to realize that that's the pivotal moments where you gotta like change. Mm-hmm. Some things gotta change. Definitely. And, I'm a, at, and a lot of people, that's the thing, the crazy thing about the change thing, like people scared of it. Like it's like, it, like people are really in, like some people are really in fear of even trying. They only know that's the change. That's facts. Look at the hood mentality. Mm-hmm. That's all another joke. But what's crazy is bro, my, the week before, um, I, think, I believe it was like a week before, a week and a half, my sister passed away. And that was like the hardest moment of my fucking life. Because mm-hmm. I had to really, I had to really like think, am I even mentally here to go to class or to care about school? Like, I don't care about nothing at this point. Right. And that's where you suffer, or the black community, or a lot of people will suffer from some called cognitive dissonance. Mm-hmm. It's where you disassociate yourself emotionally and you really don't understand what's going on. Right, that PST, PST, PSTD? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but a lot of people don't even know what that is. A lot of people don't understand why they can't correlate emotions with their actions. Right. And that, you know, just doing your research on mental health, like you said earlier, is big. Right, right. So, tell me about a time. You said that was an uncomfortable time for you. So, would you think that was the most uncomfortable you ever been right there in that moment? Like, losing your sister and no, like, I want to give up. But yeah. sis wouldn't want me to. My family wouldn't want me to. I can't let this, like, you just, like, being from Chester, you don't probably survive the shootout or two. You don't probably survive <laughs> some stuff. Like, Phil, you can't let this be the reason. <laughs> I live in fear every day. I got survivor's guilt. Uh, I, seriously, bro, I live in fear. When somebody texts me at 1 o'clock, you don't, you don't want to even read it. I don't even want to read it. Bro, I hear that notification. I'm, nah. Mm-hmm. 
and that's that. bad. Mm -hmm. That's really bad because we all go through it, mm -hmm. especially when you're hearing gunshots every day. Right. Um, what everybody's been through right. collectively. Right, right. All right, and I also seen that you like you recently. You said you was at Harvard. I be paying attention to what you be posting and stuff like that. You said you was at Harvard. Like, um, yeah. So me and my experience go. It was pretty overwhelming. Uh, you know, when you are bro, we come from the hood. Mm -hmm. The trenches. Mm -hmm. So when you're around people that come from money and you're around people that come from education, mm -hmm. it'll make you think and make you like just notice yourself even more. Like, um, the, more so, the more stuff the eyeball. Like you see how, how more and more you the eyeball. Here. Yeah. Okay. And real rap. I'm not. I'm probably the most special one in that room because we create the wave. Exactly. And literally most of, so black people spend a trillion dollars, not a billion. You know, uh, it's astronomical when you think about it, trillion versus a billion. Mm -hmm. uh, but black people spend about a trillion dollars or more than a trillion, one trillion uh, in revenue on shit in America. Right. So we create the wave. Mm -hmm. So when you sit in that room and all of these intellectuals, they looking at you as, you know, you are that melanin coated pigmentation that that you are God, nigga. Mm -hmm. Like that, that actually keep this. That actually keep all business rolling. For real, that for real. literally keeps all business. If it wasn't for us, business wouldn't be rolling. Right, right, right. Um, and it's good for these people to know that. In fact. Uh, I was watching again uh, Virgil Blah this seminar uh, in, fa in regards to fashion and architect, and I learned a lot of hidden gems. In fact, Harvard has a lot of free classes that the youth can take just to expand their horizons. Uh, it's free. You can go right on Google and type in Harvard classes, but just to see what it's like to be in those type of atmospheres. Mm -hmm. It's different. It's different. And I also seen that Harvard just hired their first black female president. Yeah, oh, that okay. was big. Uh, it, was she it, there? Did you get to see her? No, like, I didn't. I can't okay. get to see her. Okay. okay. <laughs> I, I wish. Um, <laughs> but. All right. So as far as man, what keeps you pushing every day? Like you said, it's the city and stuff like that. But the city, the city pushing us can. I noticed that can only take us but so far. Like I feel like the city pushed me to know that I wanted to go to college and experience something different. But after that, you got to figure out like, all right. I'm not trying to go back to the city and do yeah. the same stuff I was doing. So what keeps you pushing? Like, is it, would you say it's the people you work with or the celebrities or like, what would you, how do you think, what is it? Uh, I always say this on like most of my interviews, man. Uh, and it's something that's really deeply embedded in me is figuring out that information and bringing it back um, and giving it to Spread people. It Spreading it out, giving it to the community. I'm big on that. Right. Uh, every just learning, man. Well, what keeps me going is realizing, like, every day is not promised. Mm -hmm. I, the reason why I hurt me so much about my sister, uh, going back to that, is because I talked to her around, like, 11.30, and she was gone by 12. Mm -hmm. And I received a phone call at 1.30. And, that, and that's what goes back to you getting phone calls late at night and scared to answer. That's another reason. PTSD. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's crazy, because the final words was... I'll talk to you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And when people say, I'll talk to you tomorrow, it's tomorrow just, is you not. Can't count on it. You can't count on it. That, that, was the, that was the biggest realization for me. Okay, okay. So, um, so you would say that's what keeps you going, like knowing that like, all right, I know it can be over. And like for you, you just said you could have died. Like a lot of stuff in your life led up to this point. It's just like, yeah, man, and it's just the youth, mm -hmm. like just seeing a, the look on their face when they discover something new or different outlet. And you just change their perspective. You can literally alter their perspective, and when you see how that, when you see how much passion you're instilling them mm -hmm. later on down the line, and you notice uh, this young boy named Rod Rod D. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like the young boy named mm -hmm. Rod D. Uh, is passionate about going into sports but not really having a primary role in sports kind of taking a video approach i want right. to have videography for football players right right and you give them a camera right right see what that young boy gonna do because later down the line bro he gonna be it right, right. and it's off of you giving him that different outlet right, right. so you worked hard up to this point man and like i know you do a lot of work at rec philly 
Mm-hmm. They also had just had an award show, man. You got yeah. nominated for three awards. How did that feel? It just felt like I'm recognized, man. Okay. Uh, I got nominated with Ken Apparel, a apparel line that literally was sponsored uh, and funded on Shark Tank. Mm-hmm. So Ken Apparel, who developed a satin hoodie um, for people like us, mm-hmm. a hair to retain that texture and that moisture, mm-hmm. um, revolutionary patent. I'm putting a place in a category with people like her for top product creator. Right, that's tough. Uh, I had independence that doesn't mean alone, which means that I was known as front of collaborations mm-hmm. and the people that I'm actually in a room with off camera. And then uh, top growth award, which means uh, in a, during a pandemic, I had, I created a brand and made, we're not even gonna come to that, but I created my aesthetic and I understood who I was and, and quickly navigated through these this labyrinth for life, right? Right, right. <laughs> That's where you going. So, I know you got nominated for three awards. You didn't win any awards. So how does that feel? Because I know I'm the, the like, competitive. For, yeah, competitive. Yeah. I, I'm competitive too, but like, with stuff like this, I'm not competitive. Like, right. I created this. I didn't create this with no <laughs> awards. Like, right. feel me? I ain't expecting no <laughs> awards. So I wouldn't care about it. But how did you feel like not getting no award? Or you just, it sounds to me like you was just happy, like, damn, I'm here with who? Y'all got me in the category? Nah, they had to tell me that. They had to tell me that because the fire inside me, I'm like, bro, I'm about to make everybody in this room a believer. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to drop hot shit all month. Mm-hmm. I got 10 photo shoots and 10 products in my phone right now okay. that I'm going to drop. Okay. And they're going to fill every one of it. Okay. That's what my natural instinct was. But, you know, talking to my guy, Melo, um, as artists, me and him actually got sponsored for WXPN and Black Music City on a hundred thousand dollar grant with forty seven other uh, entries or people that got uh, sponsored. Um, he told me he like, yo, listen, I got this book for you. He like, I want you to read it because you're supposed to be looking at this situation different. Mm-hmm. The fact that you got nominated three times was the only person to get nominated in multiple categories three times. And it's people big. that's been with Rec Philly since the day that it started, it's not even in none of these. Mm-hmm. You should look at it different. Right, definitely, definitely. It's crazy because that's how I look at everything. I don't do stuff for no awards. Yeah. It's just like, all right, that's cool, but I can't eat that award. It's not. Yeah. That's not going to pay the bills. Like, Facts. <laughs> like that right there, it's all cute and dandy. It ain't going to pay the bills. Facts. So... As far as like, man, your confidence, man, just like, I heard you just talk heavy. So would you say this the most confident you ever been? Like, did you, you think that situation put the batter in your back or like, what would you say? How do you in that situation? I was in, uh, you know, one of my classrooms, professor, mm-hmm. Jim Thompson, uh, and another professor, Professor Jay, um, they told me specifically, and I never heard this term before, and it was during the same day, which I know God was like, yo, like using them as a vessel, but it was like, yo, like, you have humble confidence. I went home and Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it, Google it. You don't know, so I'm Googling. Right. Um, it was like, yo, having confidence, but not being too overspoken, not being too much extra about it. Mm-hmm. You just know you know something. Mm-hmm. And I take that same approach with understanding and knowledge. I study a lot religiously. I read a lot. Right. I wake up at five thirty every single morning to read right. at least five chapters. That's a great habit to have. At I'm least, to get there. you know what I mean. And that's and this is not to make anybody else feel like they're not on their shit. But this is just some things I'm taking a Kobe like mentality for Brent for for growth. Mm-hmm. I want to grow every single day of my life. Right. Right. We talk about a lot of stuff, but like, what's next for Keith Moore and the brand, man? Like, what do you have next? What can you promote and tell the people what's coming and what they can look out for, man? So I just got some investors. Um, and in 2023, just expect for me to collaborate with a lot of local artists. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely starting up uh, this maybe a podcast or visuals called um, Having a Strong Aura which is having a mental fortitude, like right. some of the topics that we discuss and mm-hmm. how they can counter that and uh, just grow. And as far as fabrics, man, uh, so I got some syncs coming out with DJ Diamond Cuts, four DJ Diamond Cuts for a collaboration. 
I'm working well with uh, Rec Philly, so we, I got some things dropping for them, and it's all about just growth. Um, I don't even know where I'm going to be at in the next five months, but all I know is the things that I got on my phone, as soon as I got is high, high, high quality, bro, and when I drop, hopefully it's another sellout. Right? <laughs> and I also see you work with Mike Stallings. How is that? How is that going to play? How did that come about? That relationship? Yeah. Like, Mike will go. And hell, every time we had a meeting, I'd be like, yo, bro, you're a genius. You know, you're a jack of all trades. Um, I think we was talking about this, like, earlier. But Michael is definitely a jack of all trades. Um, the best creative director that I know. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, like, the trade that energy. Like, you know, we boost each other up. Um, even with the projects that we're working on. Like, me and Michael established an aesthetic. So if you go back and look at the, the sneaks that I made for Will Toms, co-founder of Brett Philly, or Quincy, uh, P. Diddy's son, or uh, Carter Visions, for, uh, Meek Mill's personal photographer and videographer, you'll see that aesthetic that we created. Uh, and, you know, man, just the people, again, that I'm, the network that I'm surrounded by is crazy. Right. So it's a lot of kids that pay attention to the podcast, watch yeah. the concrete. Like, they gonna be watching this. They gonna wanna know, like, like, some inspirational words or some guidance you can give them just from here to let them know, like, they can be you one day. It can just possible. Yeah. Um, don't be me. <laughs> Everybody got their unique aura. Right, be yourself. Be yourself. Because you wanna find out that being yourself is way more valuable than being somebody else. Right. And then from here, that's a hard thing to understand. That's Everybody hard to like somebody. The trap is exactly what it implies. A trap. Mm-hmm. Why do you think they call them rats? Mm-hmm. When you tell the rats, trap, that should correlate. The moment that you realize that these words are exactly what they imply is when you understand that being you is far more valuable. Mm-hmm. Reach out to people like Mel or me or people that you see doing different things because more than likely they've been through the same thing as you. They got the same story as you, but it's a gem. They walk in gems. Uh, we walk in gems and we can more than likely uh, speak on a lot of stuff, had a lot of knowledge on different things. Definitely. And the most stupidest person in the room is the person that don't <laughs> what? Ask. The teacher was right. She told me that. Um... Yeah, just just in and just in and off, man. Uh, it's it's just hard being us, being where we from, and seeing that that hood distinction, right. where somebody f- from a block, couple blocks down, gunning for your head top, mm-hmm. <laughs> or and that's the same. If you go back and you know the history, you'll see them in the same pictures as young boys. Mm-hmm. That's a hard mentality to go by. Right. You know, it's like if you even seen what somebody else is bad. Uh, and I'm here to tell you, ain't nobody going to stop me. Bitch, I can be seen with whoever I want. If y'all want that freedom, fuck it. Don't That's how I feel too, <laughs> man. You ain't going to say nothing to me if you see me with nobody. So don't even talk to me about that type of stuff. Because we don't handle ourselves like that. We right. like excellence. Man. Yeah. All right, man. This is episode 37 of The Concrete, man. Appreciate my guy, King Ford, for coming through, man. Fact. Giving us some gems. Uh, keep commenting, keep liking, keep subscribing, and pay attention, man. He got some big things coming. As you he said so that he got them investors. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> the Tyler signs. <laughs> so I feel like, man, keep appreciate y'all. Keep tuning in, man.